Amen. Thank you, Brother and Sister Jackson, for doing that for me. I thought it was very, uh, very relevant to the message this morning. I want to ask everyone to go with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, our text this morning will come from verses 9 through 13. Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. I'll be reading from the King James Version. And it reads, After this manner, therefore, pray ye, this is Jesus speaking, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I want to use as a title today, Humanity's Greatest Prayer. Amen. Humanity's Greatest Prayer. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this time. We thank you, Lord God, for what you have carried us through and what you are carrying us to. And Lord God, it is only because of our spirit of prayer. It is only because of our dedication. It is only because of your faithfulness to us, Lord God, that you have been able to carry us through. And so, Lord, we thank you and we give you glory. I ask, Lord God, that as we come to this time, that you open our ears and our hearts and our minds to receive what you have prepared for us. I humble myself to nothingness that you would be everything in me and that your word would go forth and perform that which you have purposed it to perform and that it would not return back void. We give you all glory and all honor and all praise in Jesus' precious name. We say amen, amen, and amen. Humanity's greatest prayer. Why would I suggest that this is humanity's greatest prayer. Well, because this is the way Jesus said himself we should pray. Now, when Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 6, after this manner, pray ye, and he goes on to recite the Lord's Prayer, he is not telling us to pray these words verbatim. He's using it as a template as a model, if you will, to tell us what the best structure of prayer should look like. This isn't coming from the opinion of Paul or David or anybody else. This is Jesus himself, the son of God, saying that if if you want your prayers to reach heaven, then it should probably look and sound like this. And it's broken down into two structures. The first part of the Lord's Prayer consists of God's interests, and the second half of the Lord's Prayer consists of our interests. So let's take a look at the, the first three petitions we find in the Lord's Prayer that we find are in the interests, interests of God. He says, in this manner pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name, holy is your name. High is your name. The first thing that we need to recognize when we pray is the greatness of God. Is the awesomeness of God. Matter of fact, right before he tells them the Lord's Prayer, he tells them how not to pray. <laughs> he tells them, don't pray out in the corner in the public square just so that you can be heard of men. He said, don't use vain repetition just to get yourself heard. And so the way he tells them not to pray before this is don't make your prayer all about you. Right? Don't make it to be seen of men. Then he says, but if you're going to pray, this is how you should pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Our prayers should always begin with the recognition of the holiness and the greatness of God. 
Because that prepares us to enter into the presence of God. That prepares us to enter into the, the, the spiritual realm of God when we want to pray. Then he says, thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. This represents the standard of the kingdom of God that we want to be present on the earth. Now, we're living in a culture and a world right now where everybody has its loyalties. Somebody's leaning to the left. Somebody's leaning to the right. Somebody's leaning conservative. Somebody's leaning liberal. Somebody's leaning Democrat or, 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 or Republican or independent or libertarian. Somebody has a, a, a system that they would prefer to be prevalent in society. But Jesus says our prayer is that his kingdom would come. And his kingdom existed long before there was a United States of America. His kingdom existed long before there was a British empire or a Roman empire or this uh, uh, dynasty or a that dynasty. God's kingdom has been established from everlasting to everlasting. And if we ever want the perfect existence to come on the earth, it cannot come from our idea of the perfect culture but of the kingdom standard that has already been established from everlasting to everlasting so our prayer should be that his kingdom would come on the earth as a matter of fact I recall in Matthew chapter 16 when Jesus asked the disciples, who do men say that I am? He said, well, some say you're Jeremiah, Elijah, or one of the prophets. He asked them, well, who do you say that I am? He said, well, you're Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. He said, uh, blessed are you, Simon Bar Jonah, Simon, son of Jonah. Flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but uh, the Holy Spirit revealed this to you. And your name shall be called Peter, which means rock. And on this rock, this rock is the revelation that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. Will I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. That means... The responsibility of the church is to recognize the standard of the kingdom of heaven and enforce that standard on earth. That means no other standard matters. No other, no other foundation matters because the foundation of Jesus Christ and his heavenly standard has been established. And our prayer should be that that standard is the only standard that matters on earth. His kingdom come, thy will be done. The only way the kingdom can be established on the earth is we would surrender ourselves to his will. Now, how many find that hard to do? I, I just, just to be honest, it's hard enough for us to surrender our will to the people we see every day, let alone a God who is unseen. And yet, we must Pray that his will be done. But if we recognize the fact that God's will will only result in our good. If we recognize and acknowledge the fact that God's will, whether we know it or not, or whether we're afraid of it or not, that God only wants what's best for you. God only wants what's good for you. God only wants what is going to work out for your good. And so if you would surrender yourself to his will, whether you know what's going to happen or not, you can know that whatever happens, it will work out for your good. So surrender yourself to his will. Pray that God's will is done in your life and that God's will is done in the earth. Don't be afraid of God's will. And so what Jesus is saying in this first part of the Lord's prayer is that when you pray, pray that the sovereignty of God would reign on earth and in you because it's all about God. Right. It's nothing about you. So when you begin your prayer and when you when you pray any time after this, when you begin your prayer, your prayer should be about what does God want, who he is and what he wants. And once you have put that in the forefront, then that sets the stage for everything you pray after that, because then we move on to your interests. Because your interests are going to align with God's interests when you put God's interests first. 
So then he goes on to say, give us this day our daily bread. Now we're into our interests. Give us this day our daily bread. A real quick uh, story about the Israelites when they were wandering in the, in, uh, through the wilderness. After they left Egypt, they were complaining about not having enough food. And where are they going to get food? And we should have stayed in Egypt. At least they have food. We're going to die out here in this wilderness. And, and God sent manna from heaven. And he gave them some rules. He said, I'm going to send down some manna from heaven. And all I need you to do is gather what you need for that day. Amen. Don't gather more. Don't gather less. If you gather more and try to store it up, it's going to spoil. So gather just what's necessary for your house for today. And what our prayer should be is before we start praying for the things that we want, God wants us to focus on those physical and spiritual necessities that are necessary for today. I'll take care of the extra stuff. I'll, I'll take care of the other stuff. But I want you to pray for the necessity spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically for today. As a matter of fact... I remember Jesus saying later in the scripture, don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear. I've got that even taken care of for the doves. The Gentiles think about that stuff, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things that you want will be added unto you. So seek this day your daily bread. But listen to what he says. He says, your prayer shouldn't be give me this day my daily bread. Give us this day, our daily bread. And see, as a church, we need to remember that you're not the only one sitting in the pew. As a church, we need to remember that, 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 that the pastor has some needs too. I saw an image on Twitter the other day that talked about why we need to pray for our pastors. And it gave statistics about how many pastors uh, suffer from depression and, and, and how many pastors uh, leave the ministry broke. How many pastors give up on this and give up on that because somehow we forget that the pastor is human too. The pastor has struggles too. The pastor needs some prayer too. And, and the person sitting next to you in front of you and behind you. And so when we pray, let's not just remember ourselves but say, Lord, give us, give them, give him, give her, give everyone around me that I call myself fellowshipping with every Sunday this day, our daily bread. What, they, what do they need today? Pray for your neighbor. Then he tells us to say, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. When we think about the word forgive, I think about how we use it in the context we use it today. Of course, we know that Jesus has forgiven our sins and thank God for the forgiveness of sins. Uh, past, present, and future. We should also forgive others. And some people might not commit the type of heinous sins against us as we may have committed against God. But there's some folks that have done us wrong. There's some folks that have uh, spoken wrong against us. There are some folks that have done wrong against us. And, the, and Jesus says, forgive. We should pray that the Lord forgive us as we forgive others. And what I will also say is our ability to forgive others comes from God's willingness to forgive us. And so I looked up the translation of forgiveness, and though there were many, one resonated with me, and it simply said, let it go. Let it go. It says, let it alone. Let it be. Disregard to keep no longer. And so when we think about the things, the, the folks we have to deal with at work that said something funky to you, the, 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 the person that passed you uh, uh, on, the, on the freeway that looked at you the wrong way, the person the, that you, that, that family member, that cousin, that auntie, that uncle that just, that's just not doing you right, every once in a while you just got to take a minute and say, Lord, I'm going to let it go. I'm not going to ask for nothing else from them. I might not try to deal with them anymore, but when it comes to this, I'm going to let it go. 
Because guess what? I guarantee you that the, if you're holding a grudge against somebody, they're sleeping good tonight. While you tossing and turning, fussing within yourself about what they did wrong to you. And while you talking to this person and that person and this person. And God said, you know what? You've done a whole lot worse to me and I let it go on the cross. I'm telling you to let it go. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Then he says, lead us not into temptation. Some have struggled with this because why would we pray that the Lord... Uh, not lead us into temptation. Well, the Lord doesn't lead us into, tempta into temptation. So I researched the literal translation of this verse and it is prevent us from br being brought into temptation too great for us to conquer. And he's already promised that too. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, he says, there is no temptation that has come to you that uh, I will allow you to suffer more than you can bear. And with every temptation, I have given you a way of escape. Okay. And so you're going to be tempted, but you're not going to be tempted any more than your neighbor or the next guy or the next guy because sin is sin and sin is always going to come after you. So you don't suffer any more temptation than somebody else. But what God said is with every temptation that you encounter, there's a way of escape. There's an exit door. There's a solution. There is a way out. There's a way uh, through that temptation. And so what we pray is, Lord, don't allow us to uh, put ourselves in a situation that we can't get out of. And he won't. And so what we must remember is that the focal point, and I like this because it's about his interests and our interests. But our interests include the interests of our neighbor. This is Jesus' perfect prayer. And it aligns with Jesus' perfect commandment that you would love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength, and that you would love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Then it goes on to say the doxology, they call the doxology of this prayer, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Now, Many scholars and, and biblical scholars dispute this particular doxology because it doesn't, it's not found in your oldest manuscripts, those manuscripts that even predate the King James. And so some dispute whether to recognize this particular part of it or not, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. So I will just use this uh, disclaimer that I am personally choosing to recognize it, and here's why. Because it emphasizes that prayer should begin and end with focus on the sovereignty of God. The perfect prayer begins with the recognition of the hollowness of God and the need for God's kingdom to reign on the earth and that his will would be done. And it ends recognizing the fact that everything belongs to God and that God doesn't owe us anything, but we owe him everything. And so the perfect prayer begins and ends with God. And when it begins and ends with God, then our needs are invariably met. And so, and it also, I looked at this and I saw that thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory also aligned with the first three petitions of the Lord's prayer. For thine is the kingdom, Lord, let your kingdom come on the earth. For thine is the power, let your will be done on the earth. For thine is the glory, hallowed it be your name. Lord, every prayer that I pray, let it start and end with you. Every prayer that I pray, let the focus be you. Lord, let every prayer that I pray be about your kingdom. And after all is said and done, we need to recognize that everything belongs to God. And, and while we're taking care of house business and, and while we're taking care of church business and while we're taking care of money business and organizational business, we need to remember that uh, heaven and earth is going to pass away, but his earth, but his word will never pass away. And after I'm dead and gone and after 
pastor's dead and gone, and after laying as a heap of ashes, and after CME Church no longer exists, his kingdom will always reign forever and never and ever. And if we want his kingdom to reign on the earth, he needs to be the focal point. Amen. And so the kingdom of God, church, is not about things and stuff. We got to take care of business. We got to take care of church business. We got to take care of household business. When I go home, I'm going to have bills to pay. We got to buy groceries. Got to get ready to pay a mortgage, a car note. We got to take care of business. But I can't let too much time go by without me recognizing the focal point of my life. And that's my wife and children. Because if I'm too busy focusing on things and stuff, then I'm going to lose the most important part of my life. If we get too focused on, on things and stuff that could potentially divide us, we forget the main purpose. We show up on Sunday in the first place, and that is to worship our Lord and God. Amen. And so Romans 14 and 17 says the kingdom of God is not meat or drink. It's not things and stuff, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And that's what I show up to church to get. I, I show up to church to experience his righteousness. I, I show up the choice to experience his joy. I, I show up the church to experience his peace in the Holy Ghost. Not strife, not divisiveness, not all of this other stuff. Because when I come in and when I leave, I want to leave better than I came in in the first place. And our prayer should be focused on the end that the kingdom of God and the power of God would reign on the earth and in our lives. After this manner pray, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen, amen, and amen. The doors of the church are open. He was there all the time. He was there all the time, waiting patiently in line. God was there all the time. He was there all the time. He was there all the time. Waiting patiently in line. God was there all the time. I bet y'all believe that. He was there. All the time, oh, my God was there. All the time, uh, waiting patiently, waiting patiently.
give you one more person that man. He was there. Yeah, yeah. All the time. All the time. I mean, y'all glad about that. God was there. All the time. Waiting patiently. Waiting patiently. God, he was there. All the time. I'm thankful this morning. I think that Sister Keith went to her. You went to your 45th, Sister Keith. And I went to my 40th. And when they called her, they, they did a memorial of those that's not there anymore. And to me, we have, she belongs to her grandfather. We, we have to be thankful. The main thing is not that the Astros don't go to the uh, World Series. But the main thing is that we prepare our heart through prayer that when we get ready and God call us home that we'll go to his world series thank you preacher Bishop Gilbo said if it's not leaning don't prop it up amen I think we have some people that want to meet so we're going to close it out we're going to close it out for us Lord, we thank you for teaching us to pray. And we thank you, Lord God, that you are always there from everlasting to everlasting. And so, Lord, as we prepare to leave this place, keep us, Lord God, this week till we meet again, Lord God. Make us better today than we were yesterday and tomorrow than we are today, Lord God. We love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we give you the glory, honor, and praise that is due your name now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory majesty dominion and power both now and forever we say amen amen and amen God bless you Wow. let's do that let's see if I can say it which one what you just saw he was there we, we, we just missed churches over